Hi everyone, I'm Stephen and welcome to Watch Out. Today I'm going to talk with you about two things. Firstly, about the specific requirements of cameras for being able to film watchmaking. And then I'm going to talk in more specific terms about my particular filming setup. Bearing in mind that I think any setup is always evolving over time. It never stays the same and mine is certainly evolving. I've not actually as yet filmed me working on a watch with this particular setup. That's how rapidly it has been evolving. So you need to wait for the next watchmaking video. But I certainly can show the setup to you. But most importantly, I think show you the, the caveats as to what is required for cameras and lenses to be able to film watchmaking. Because I did a reasonable amount of research myself. I didn't really find anything on YouTube that talked about what I'm about to talk about. I guess I kind of worked it out from looking at other people's watchmaking videos and seeing what equipment they were using. Some people, they list the equipment that they shoot with down the uh, in the comments or in the description of their video. So that was a help. But anyway, let's dive right into it and talk about some of the, the technical caveats. So normally, in photography, there are certain presuppositions that, that drive what it is that people want, I guess, in choosing a camera. So in photography, people are often looking for the subject itself to be in focus and the background to be out of focus. So that's how you get that classic creamy, blurred background that is very, very typical in wedding photography, for example. And that is driven also to an extent, one by lens selection, but also the form factor of your sensor. So the general principle is that the larger the sensor is, that the actual light is going onto the sensor and is being digitized by your camera, the larger the sensor is, the more conducive that sensor will be to giving you the, those creamy kind of images. So that's one of the reasons why professional photographers, for example, they will generally shoot full frame cameras. And that just means that it has a full sized sensor inside of the camera. Those kind of cameras, they generally take uh, larger lenses that will allow more light in and having the lens wide open. So allowing the maximum amount of light into the lens is how you get those really fantastic looking creamy kind of shots. Now, the problem is, is that in watchmaking, we don't want that. Because you see, in normal photography, the subject is perpendicular to the camera. So you imagine a, a plane, an imaginary plane that the subject is standing in, and that plane is in focus. What is in front of that plane is out of focus. What is behind that plane is out of focus. So if you have a person standing in front of you and you're a person too, you're standing holding the camera pointing straight at them, the subject, the person is perpendicular to the camera. So you're gonna focus on, you know, they might be four meters away. You'll focus on them and what's four meters away from you will be in focus what's five meters away from you won't be in focus. So that works beautifully when the subject is perpendicular to the camera. The problem is that in watchmaking, the subject generally isn't perpendicular to the camera. And the reason for that is because in watchmaking, you want to have multiple shooting angles. And you can see that in my setup, if we just have a look at the, the different angles that I have now, so I have an overhead angle, and I do that with a microscope. I have an angle that is a high zoom macro that is coming from my right. And then I have a sort of a, a general uh, B camera that is directly in front of me. So it's looking back towards me. So I have three angles. And the reason that I have three angles is you'll 
filming working on the watch. So if I get a screwdriver out, for example, and I come over here and I do this, well, with my A camera, all you can see is my big fat fingers that are out of focus. So that A camera shot is absolutely useless. So I'm probably going to use, in this case, I'm probably going to use a shot that's coming from the microphone, microscope, pardon me, because you can quite clearly see what it is that I'm doing. And I might lead into that with the, the B shot that's coming from that camera right there that is pointing back towards me. So you want to have multiple shots because your fingers will get in the way and it means that you'll have a shot that is usable at all times, hopefully. And because you have multiple cameras shooting from different angles, then it means that they are not shooting perpendicular to the subject. So if I just bring you guys in, I'm filming this on my iPhone 8, by the way. If I bring you guys in, you'll just be able to see that a bit more clearly. So here is the subject. The plane of the subject is this way. And here is the plane that the camera is shooting at. The camera is shooting at 45 degrees to the subject. Okay, so what that means is if we were to shoot this with um, the lens wide open, so we talk about f-stops, this is not meant to be a full-on camera lesson, so you'll need to go and research what I'm talking about if you don't know what I mean here. But this lens goes down to, um, this is an f2.8. So that means that the widest it can be open in terms of f-stops is 2.8. I think the easiest way is if I just show you what this looks like. So this is a classic example as to what we're talking about. With this lens wide open at f2.8, shooting at 45 degrees, you can see that the center of the watch, this part here, this is in focus. This is out of focus. This is out of focus. So this shot would be absolutely useless. I couldn't use this at all. But this is supposedly, this is the ideal of photography, is to have a wide open lens with the focal distance being in focus and everything out, else out of focus. It's absolutely useless. So I hope that makes sense, but if it did, it should be clear that wide open f-stops are absolutely useless to us in watchmaking. So if I now go, let's go to f11. Okay, so there's f11. You can see that if you just look at the, the balance, you'll see that the balance is just slightly out of focus. So f11 is kind of workable, but if we now go to f20, now you can see that the entire movement is in focus. That's what we need for watchmaking, is we need the entire movement to be in focus. So there is absolutely no point spending a heap of money to buy a, a lens that will shoot at, say, f2 even. I mean, f2 is generally considered to be fairly fast, but you can get lenses that will go down to... 1.2, I think there's even some out there that will go below one. They're generally pretty expensive. They'd be absolutely useless for this application. So that's learning number one, is that low f-stop numbers are no use to us whatsoever in watchmaking, and the kinds of things that you would normally do to get them, such as buying a full-frame camera or buying a lens that will give you a, a low f-stop number, is absolutely useless to us in watchmaking. Now, as I mentioned, generally speaking, the larger the sensor, the more you tend to get this effect pronounced. So a full frame camera is really no use to us. I mean, you can use one if you want to, and I know some people do, but you would not buy a full frame camera just to do watchmaking. You'd buy it because you want to use full frame for something else. Um, so I'm using APS-C cameras so also known as, as crop sensors. So they have a, a smaller sensor and you know most of your entry level, medium range um, 
DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, they are APS-C cameras. So I'm using a, a Sony A6700, which is probably the best of the APS-C uh, mirrorless cameras that Sony has, has at the moment. It's a pretty brand new camera. And I'm using a ZV E10 as my B camera. That's the, the white one that's there in the background hiding behind the microscope. So those are both APS-C cameras. Um, I'm using these because you can change the lenses on these. I like the idea of being able to change the lenses on them. I do intend to use the A6700 for other things. So if I'm wanting to go out and about, I might just whack the, um, the kit lens, the kit zoom lens onto the A6700 and go out with that. So that's talking about uh, f-stops and how they factor in filming watchmaking. The other thing that we need to talk about is lenses and zoom distances or focal distances and also macro lenses. So again, in watchmaking, the normal kinds of things that apply in photography don't apply in that you're usually wanting to get a very high magnification on something and so you might be thinking to yourself straight away okay beauty then that's what we want a macro lens for well yes that is true with one very important caveat normally in using a macro lens you use a macro lens to get as close as you possibly can to the subject and still be able to focus on it the thing with watchmaking is that you still need to have enough room underneath here to be able to actually work on the movement. So, you know, really, I wouldn't want to have this lens any closer than this. And I mean, it's probably lucky for me that, you know, I'm left-handed. If I was right-handed, this lens would probably be a little bit too close as it is. So that's, that is a really important thing to know because if you work it all out and then all of a sudden to get the magnification you need, the lens is, is down here, for example. Well, that's no use at all. That's just way too close. So yes, you're probably looking at a macro lens, but you do not want to be getting so close to the movement that the lens is in the way. Most normal lenses, they can't focus quite close enough to be able to um, do what you need. Although I will say, I'm very, very impressed with this uh, 50 millimeter kit lens. So let me just zoom in all the way on this 50 mil lens, just so you can see what it can do. So that lens is probably about, I don't know, 40 centimeters or so away from the movement. And that's zoomed in all the way. But these Sony cameras also get a digital zoom. So if I go in on a digital zoom, that's the full digital zoom. That's just with the, the standard 16 to 50 millimeter kit lens that comes with the Sony's ZV E10. So that's actually, you know, if I wanted to have a B shot that had a fair bit of zoom, that's pretty good. And I can actually move the camera fairly close and it will still focus, not quite true macro, but it all just depends on the particular focal properties of the lens. So that's really what you've got to research. So I, I think um, hopefully I've covered that clearly enough that those are really the two main things that, that need to be considered is f-stops, as we talked about at the beginning, and then also lenses and zoom di distances to be able to get the particular shots that you want to get. Um, the other thing is, is focus itself. There are some really nice looking lenses out there, but they are fully manual lenses. And I almost was going to buy one of them, but I ended up buying this um, Sigma 70 millimeter uh, lens, which gives me, it's actually a full frame lens. This is the Sigma 70 millimeter art macro lens and because it's a full frame lens on an APS-C so the length of the lens is given for the center that the lens is designed for so this, this lens is a full frame lens so it's designed to work with a 
a full frame sensor. So if you put it on an APS-C camera like this one, it means that the image will actually be one and a half times bigger because that's the 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 difference in ratio between the two length between the two sensors. You'll need to Google that if that doesn't quite make sense. So, but what that means, if this camera was a full frame camera, I'd have to put a 105 millimeter lens on the camera for it to look exactly the same as what you're seeing now. So the 70 millimeter lens, full frame lens on an AT. APS-C sensor gives me 105 millimeters equivalent. Also one really nifty feature of these Sony mirrorless cameras is their digital zoom. So I can get a one and a half times digital zoom. So that takes me with this lens from a 105 millimeter equivalent up to about 160 or so. So it's just nice to have that little bit of extra flexibility, effectively having a zoom without a zoom. And at 4K, I don't really lose any resolution at all. I also should mention too, that you really don't need to buy a high-end camera like an A6700. I bought one because I wanna use it for other things. It's got some really, really nice features, but they're not necessary for watchmaking, I could have bought two ZVE-10s for the price of one of these A6700s. The ZVE-10 is an excellent camera and will really work very well for watchmaking. So you'd only buy an A6700 if you had something else that you wanted to use it for, as I do. Okay, so yeah, so the great thing about them being focusing lenses is that it means that I can just, I just put it out of focus. I can now just go and hit the hit the focus button. It doesn't quite get it right all the time, but I think I can actually, yeah, that's it. I can tap on the touch screen and say, I want you to focus on that and it will focus on it. And I can do the same thing on my B camera. So I generally do run them in um, manual focus mode because I don't want them to hunt around, you know, if I was doing this, sticking my fingers and so on, it would be focus hunting all the time. And so that would be pretty terrible. So we don't want it to do that. And I haven't really talked that much about the, the microscope. Um, so I actually did make a video about this microscope. So you might want to go and check that out. Probably the only thing to notice, I'll just swing you around so you can see. I hope you can see that, but the microscope is actually tilted at an angle down towards the movement. And that is because if it was straight top down, every time I put, every time I tried to work on it, every time I put a screwdriver in there, you would only see my fingers. So having it like this, it means that I can actually work on the movement you know, like so, and have my fingers out of the way and you can actually still, you can actually still see it um, through the microscope. So it's about maximizing the chances that there'll be, out of the, the three video sources, there'll be a shot that is actually usable. So I hope that kind of is, is clear enough about the cameras themselves. I just want to talk a little bit more now about the the filming setup in general because there might be some tips in that that are helpful to you. So I'll just bring you out so you can see it. All right, so this is a bit of a, a wide view as to what we're looking at. So I've got a bank of four monitors on the back wall there. That's so that I can see all of the camera outputs. So there are three cameras and they all have HDMI outputs and I have them giving a clean feed so I can see nothing but the video as it is being recorded. And that's just so that I can make sure that everything is in shot and in focus because it's so easy to just be working away and for some reason the focus is gone or the shots moved and you end up with 20 minutes of footage that you can't use from one or even worse, more than one camera. 
Um, you just really can't see enough squinting at the, the screens on the back of the cameras. And often you can't get the screen where it needs to be to be able to see it anyway. So the, the ZV-E10 that shoots, that's right in front of me, I can't see the screen on it at all. So it's much better just to have those four monitors. I just bought those on eBay. They're just like BenQ. Um, you know, they'd come from some office that had closed down, so they were like 50 bucks each or something. So just buy the cheapest monitor that will do what you need. So the two monitors on the right, I'll just come up a bit. The two monitors on the right are the two Sony cameras. The monitor on the left bottom is the HDMI feed coming out of the microscope. And the monitor on the top is the output of the Mac Mini. So I've got a Mac Mini, which is actually my editing computer as well. There's uh, an Elgato uh, USB HDMI capture, uh, so Camlink 4K, an Elgato Camlink 4K, which the microscope is also plugged into. So there's a HDMI splitter. So one half of the splitter goes to the bottom monitor, the other half goes into the Elgato, which goes into the Mac Mini. And then the top screen is the output of the Mac Mini. So right now it's, it's looking at the, the recording, but if I do anything on the Mac Mini, that will be that one. Um, the other thing to consider is sound. So you need to be able to synchronize all of the footage together somehow or other if you've got multiple sources. So I use um, DaVinci Resolve to do my video editing. And it's just a very simple feature in DaVinci Resolve to sync all the video up using audio. But that means you've got to have audio on all of your video channels. And obviously you're going to want one audio source that you're actually going to use. So I'm still sort of working out um, how I'm going to do audio. I've just been using the best audio track out of one of the cameras. So usually what I do is I have a lavalier connected to my ACAM. Um, that lav is actually on me right now. I'm using it right now. But I'm wanting to upgrade the audio a little bit in future. So I'll see where I go with that. But the microscope does not have an audio input on its camera. You need the audio, otherwise you can't sync it up. So the simplest way is the Mac Mini has just got a line in. So I've just got um, a lavalier. It, I ha actually had a TRRS lavalier mic lying around um, that I'd bought ages ago to plug into my iPhone. So I'm just using that. So that's that lavalier, is, it's just hooked on to this cable here. So that's plugged into the Mac Mini. And usually if I use the other lavalier, I usually just have that clipped on. I usually just clip that onto one of these wires up here. As I say, it's on me right at the moment. And that's just to capture background sounds, you know, like when the spring flies away, for example, and I groan, you get that's captured. But I don't try to, I don't try to do commentary over the video. I did with, I think, with the first couple of videos. But if you do that, you'll end up with a video that's like two hours long. And I just think that in YouTube, it's a real struggle for people to watch anything that is longer than one hour. So for a, a typical watchmaking video, I kind of find that, I mean, it's it's hours and hours and hours and hours of work easily. Um, I haven't even looked at how much footage there is. But, you know, you're looking at three cameras plus hours of work. You're looking at hours of footage. So the editing process is very, very intensive. And you need to distill all of that down to something that people are actually going to watch. I don't think that people are really interested in watching me stuffing around with a watch for hours and hours and hours. They want the, uh, the Reader's Digest version. Uh, of it heavily edited, and so that's why I do the, the commentary uh, in post. Once I've done the, the first edit, I then do the commentary over the top of that. So that talks about audio. I think the other thing to talk about is light. Obviously for filming, light is absolutely critical. Um, this is one area that 
I do need to do a little bit more work on. Uh, I think the results is okay, but it's it's emerging, and and part of that is because um, the cameras themselves are evolving. So I've only had the A6700 for a couple of weeks, so that's when the ZVE10 got relegated to the B cam, and so that sort of like changed the situation with the B cam, and I'm still just trying to work out and getting the light correct, but because I do most of my work under the microscope, it means that we have this, this really, really great light underneath the microscope. But it is a very, very focused light that is on the movement itself. And what that means is that the rest of the area around the microscope that is not in that light is quite dark. So if I just kind of turn off these other light sources, get them out of there, So I just had a couple of soft boxes that were on as well, just for the purposes of filming this video. Those soft boxes are not usually there. But this is how things look without those auxiliary lights, with just the ring light around the microscope. And it's perfectly fine to work on the movement. But if you look at the, the B camera footage, you look back here where my hand is now, it looks like it's absolute pitch black, pitch black. And even around here, it looks pretty dark and, and that's because it is pretty dark. So as I start to bring in the other lights, so I've got uh, this light here. This is just a cheapy ring light. And I do want to replace that with a better light, but it's what I've got right now. And then I bring this light in here. This is actually my Maggie lamp. And I'm just using that to sort of give me this fill in this area here. And just until I kind of get some other lights, I might, just because I've got them, I might just keep using these soft boxes because they do seem to help a little bit. They just get it. They get in the way a little bit and also it means that I've got this, if they're too close, I've got this great big light source in the corner of my eye. So it actually makes it harder for me to see and they tend to reflect off the screens as well, the monitors. So they're not ideal in that sense. But I hope this kind of makes it clear as to just how important the lighting is. I guess the only other things to point out is that just the, the workbench itself is, is really important. I've actually just upgraded this workbench. I went to Bunnings, the local hardware store yesterday, bought this sheet of ply, just screwed it down to my old workbench because I couldn't get the B-cam far enough back. So um, this has actually given me a whole lot more room in a fairly limited space to be able to get the cameras where I need them to be without a risk of them toppling off the bench, which would be pretty catastrophic. Uh, so I've got these uh, newer tabletop tripods, which are really, really good. They've got like the Arcam plates on them. It's the same plates on both cameras, so I can easily you know, switch things around if I want to. Um, Sadly, this one's no longer available. I actually prefer this one. I think it's the nicer tripod. The one at the back, I only bought that um, six weeks ago. That's the one that's available now on Amazon. But they both do the job. You can get super duper expensive carbon fiber ones, but they, you know, these live here, they don't go anywhere. So there's no point paying for a super light tripod. And I think our work here is done. I hope this video has been useful to you. As I said, I don't think there's really been that many videos on YouTube like this. If it has been useful, you might like to support me at Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash Audio Nautica is for both of my channels, Watch Out and Audio Nautica, which is about uh, hi-fi and nautical kind of things. You could also support my channel by subscribing. Give me a like comment down below and I really hope to see you on the next video and don't forget to watch out.